Welcome to First Baptist Church. I'm glad each and one of you have chosen to worship with us, either in person or if you're joining us online, welcome as well. I want to begin our service this morning by reading a passage of Scripture for us. 1 Timothy 1.15, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Today, as we worship today, I would like for you to join me in standing, but also as you're joining me in standing right now, remember that we are in need of Jesus Christ, and we are in need of him all week, but right now is the time where every, the troubles of this week, please, yeah, be, go ahead and stand up, please. Yep. <laughs> Join me in standing. <laughs> as, you, as we focus in right now, all the troubles of the week, every distraction that we have, every pressure that we have, we're not trying to ignore that they exist, but right now we're trying to focus in on what we have in Jesus Christ and to focus in on the truth of the Word of God, which is what we're especially focusing on today. So if you would, sing with me this morning, Mercy Tree.
been singing this morning. Right now, I'd like to say a quick word about a thanks to our offering. Uh, many of you have been giving sacrificially during this time, and we greatly appreciate it. Right now, if you would, bow your heads with me, and let's thank God for the, the blessings that we have through this. Lord, we love you. Lord, we are humbled to be called your children. Lord, you call us to a new life, to be a new creation in Jesus Christ, and we thank you for that. Lord, I pray that as we are your children, Lord, you call us to serve you. You call us to sacrifice for you. And I know so many have so sacrificially given during this time. So, Lord, I pray a special blessing over them. But, Lord, I pray that we would not just give financially, Lord. I pray that we would give of our lives in every way that we can and that we, in every way that we should. Lord, I pray that our lives would be marked by the service of Jesus Christ, sacrificially serving and loving each other around us, whether it be in our church in our workplace, in our community, in our family especially. Lord, I pray that we would represent Christ as best as we can, not just with our money, but also with our lives. And Lord, as we continue to worship through the reading of Scripture, through singing and through preaching, Lord, I pray that our hearts would um, become even more focused and more centered on Jesus Christ. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. We are doing one last song today in an effort to make the service a little bit shorter, so it's gonna, the service is going to be a little bit different, but right now, if you would, sing with me, His Robes for Mine, together.
our scripture reading right now. I'll read the first verse. If you would read the following and continue in the same manner. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin, once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God, so that you also might consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members are to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. Amen. If you would please be seated at this time. As I said, our order of service is going to be a little bit different. Right now, what we usually do after the next song, we're going to do right now. And if you would, let's have a prayer of confession right now. A time of when we clean our hearts, when we offer up repentance towards God. If there's any sin that needs to be taken care of. But also a prayer that we can focus in our hearts and minds on the preaching of the word of God this morning. Our God, Lord, we, we are so thankful Lord, to be a part of your family. Lord, we know that your word teaches that there is nothing a part of ourselves that can earn our way into your family, earn our way into your, your grace. The only way we are a part of your family is by your love towards us and the fact that while we were still sinning, your son still died for us. So, Lord, we come before you now, acknowledging that we need you every single day. Lord, some days we realize it so clearly that we need you, and then some, there's some days that 
we forget that we need you. So, Lord, right now, I pray that each one of us, Lord, would humble ourselves, that we'd humble ourselves before your throne, and also remember, Lord, that we have been justified by the work of Jesus Christ from his merit, from his life, from his sacrifice. Lord, I pray that as we enter into our our final song of worship for the morning, I pray that we would sing passionately. I pray that we would sing the truths that are in it, the truths of what Jesus has done for us. As we hear your word preached this morning, I pray that you would provide clarity. I pray that your word would, um, would pierce into our hearts. I pray that you would provide conviction where necessary, encouragement where necessary. I pray that we would be tender to your spirit's leading this morning. Lord, we acknowledge our need of you. And I pray, Lord, that we would remind ourselves of the truths that we're about to sing, that Jesus paid it all. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. If you would please join me in singing one last song. If you would stand, please. Jesus paid it all. Last uh, two plus years, Pastor Will has been serving with us as a pastoral intern, um, which just means he did everything we told him to do and uh, um, didn't get all the benefits of being uh, the past, uh, one of the pastors. Uh, just kidding. He uh, served faithfully. He, he did a lot with our, with our student ministry. Uh, our outreach, and so many other areas. Our desire was um, at some point to bring him on as a full-time staff member, 
Uh, with Pastor Nate Mason leaving, uh, the door was open now for us to do that, and so uh, we began discussing that. In order to bring him on as assistant pastor, though, um, according to our Constitution, he would have to candidate uh, as an assistant pastor. And so um, we began talking about that um, as leadership, and uh, I met with the deacons, and we decided that a first step in that was the deacons met uh, it was just a couple weeks ago, and they had a, just a little time of question answer with Will and asked him a variety of questions, and after that question answer time, um, they voted and uh, unanimously to recommend him to you as a church for uh, the position of assistant pastor. And so today is Will's Candidation Sunday. Um, we, it's just how it is. Um, he's been uh, leading worship, and so he's doing that, and now he's going to come up and preach. Uh, and then following uh, our service, uh, we will have a short break, and then we'll come back in here for a question answer time for you as a congregation to ask him questions. We'll talk more about that later. So, But at this time, he's going to come up and preach and share his heart with us. All right. Well, I'm glad to be up here preaching. I was talking with uh, Pastor Pete, and I was trying to figure out uh, the difference between this Sunday and another one that I was preaching. And uh, now I now I have figured it out is that um, since this is my candidation Sunday, I can hold it against you if you fall asleep. So please don't. But if you do, I understand. <laughs> uh, I would like to pray before we begin. Ask for the Lord's leading during this time. So if you would, bow your heads with me. Lord, I do pray that our hearts would be submissive to you right now. Lord, I pray that uh, as I preach, Lord, I pray that it would be your word that comes through, that it would not be anything that I am trying to accomplish apart from communicate your word as clearly as I know how. I pray that your spirit would guide me, and I pray that your spirit would be moving right now and that um, everyone listening, either online, in person, whether it's in the future, I don't know, Lord, I do pray that um, your, your, your spirit would work and would solidify in our hearts and minds Lord, the need for your word in our lives, especially as we talk about that this morning. It's in Christ's name I pray, amen. Your foundation that you live your life upon is extremely important. What you, what you build your life upon, many of you understand, is crucial In 1172, there was an architect named Donna Barto di Bernardo paid 60 coins for the bricks to build a new bell tower in his city. So from the first day of construction, the workers knew that there was going to be a problem. And after they had completed the first three stories of the building, it started to lean. Not just a little lean, it started to lean noticeably. So as the years went by, it kept on adding floor after floor and for floor, and it kept on leaning even more and more. You might be familiar with the building I'm talking about right now. It's a very historical building. People from all around the world, it's a tourist attraction, go to see this building. The structure is known as the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Does anybody know why it leans? Does anybody understand why it leans? It, it leans because it was built upon soft soil made of clay, fine sand, and then some seashells. So the tower is literally sinking into the ground right now on one side because it had a faulty foundation. Having a proper foundation is important if you are going to succeed in whatever path you find yourself taking. October is generally a time where we remember the Reformation time period. Um, the, the theme of the Reformation, which I know Pastor Pete is going to be preaching out about in a couple of weeks, but the theme of the Reformation can be summed up in five different Latin phrases. Many of you are, have heard these before. We have sola scriptura, scripture alone. We have sola grata, grace alone. Sola fide, faith alone. Sola Christus, in Christ alone. And soli deo gloria, glory to God alone. This morning, We're going to take a moment to look at the first one of those solas, sola scriptura, in scripture alone. I believe this, and I know our church believes this, that the Bible is our final authority for faith 
and life. It's the Bible alone where we place our, where, where we learn, where we grow, where we are taught from. It's not the Bible plus something else. It can't be the Bible plus something else. If you add the Bi- something else on top of the Bible, the Bible automatically becomes less, less important. So it is the Bible plus nothing. That little word alone, the, 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 the sola in the scriptura, that little word alone really does set us apart from many other faiths, many other religions. The Mormons, they believe that in the Bible plus the Book of Mormon. Jehovah's Witnesses, they believe in the Bible plus the Watchtower. Uh, The Christian scientists, they believe in the Bible plus the writings of Mary Baker Eddy. We have Seventh-day Adventists, they believe in the Bible plus the writings of Ellen White. And then we have Roman Catholics, they believe in the Bible plus the church tradition added on top of the Bible. So that little word alone really does make a big difference. And today I would like to focus in on that. And you know what? I, I'll be honest with you. I really struggled with what to preach for today because in the past I would just continue preaching uh, the series, whatever Pastor Pete's working through, uh, this being my candidation service. I really fought with it a lot about what exactly to preach for my official candidation service here. So I prayed about it. I wrestled with it. And I decided to preach about what, to, what provides the foundation for everything I believe, everything I do in ministry, how I talk to people, and by God's grace, every aspect of my life is focused in on this foundation, sola scriptura, in scripture alone. I believe this, I believe, I live for this, the word of God. We at our church here, First Baptist, we believe the Bible to be inspired, sufficient, inerrant, infallible, and the invincible word of God. So today I would like to observe with you how this word of God provides this necessary, solid foundation for us to build our Christian lives upon. So today I would like to focus in on 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. If you would turn there in your Bibles, I would like to point out from this passage that this passage is chalked full of a lot of information, a lot of deep information. So I am not going to be able to completely cover every topic on the, every single topic that could branch into these two verses. So we could spend months on this if we had the time. I have 20 minutes. So please pay attention and I will cover this as best as I can. But I do believe this is important for us to be reminded of as followers of Christ. First of all, I would like to help us focus in on the trustworthiness And the teachings of the Bible. Read with me verse 16. It says this. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. The trustworthiness and teachings of the Bible. All scripture is breathed out by God. Many of you have heard this phrase before. Many of you have probably heard his message preached on this before. But Paul takes special care here to say that the Bible is not only true, it's trustworthy. That means that we can trust the message that it communicates into our lives. But why is this statement, word of God is breathed out, why is that so important to us? Well, it means that God is the source of our scripture, all of scripture. And because of that foundation, our faith in Jesus, our faith in God, our faith that he will use his word is absolutely placed in the right place. It's trustworthy. So what does God breathed mean? Uh, in the original Greek, the word theopneustos, the word for theos, God. We have the other word pneo, which is breath. It means that its source is God. It was not the author that came up with this. It was not his friend that talked to him and told him to write it down as if a scribe, what a scribe would be doing. No, it was God, who is the source, unlike Shakespeare or any other author, it does not have a human source. It comes from God. We see this again in 2 Peter as well, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. 
So how did God bring the scriptures to us? Well, in some cases, God dictated his word directly to human writers. In other cases, he worked through their personalities. He guided their, uh, guided, guarded their thoughts, gave eyewitness testimonies to give us his inspired word. But this is more, this is more deep than just how the scriptures came to us. This is critically important for our lives, for you and I. It's to understand that scripture is God breathed originated in God. This means that there is, that it means that there's weight, that there's life-altering significance to the words of Scripture. So that means that you and I, we are to submerge our lives into the Word of God and be subject to it in every single thing that we do. That's what it means to have God as the originator of Scripture. If it was just another human author, which we've done several book studies together as a church, even since coronavirus hit, either through Zoom or in person, um, and throughout the years we've read so many books, either from uh, popular Christian authors, none of them bear the significance and the weight of the Word of God. Now, that does not mean that some people do not place that weight and significance upon a book like that, but... Those books are not inspired by God to be scripture. That's the difference. I talk with, uh, I talk with a lot of adults <clears throat> and teenagers quite a bit who do not yet know Jesus Christ. I say yet. Give it time. <laughs> what is extremely common is for them to be um, grasping for morality and truth out of thin air. They'll grab at anything they can to find some ultimate truth. If you were to ask them what feels right today, they might give you a different answer tomorrow. What compels them to do something good towards another human being this week might not be enough motivation for them next week to do the same kind of good thing towards someone else. I see it. I see them get frustrated when, they're, when they don't know how to respond to a, a, a tragedy in the world, to human trafficking. Many will say, oh, that's horrible. That's horrible. Well, why is it horrible? Well, because it's horrible. They don't know how to understand, how to, how to comprehend uh, murder and why that's against God's law because they just understand murder is wrong, but why? Well, it's just because murder is wrong. They're grasping at anything they can for truth other than God. I see it all the time when they get frustrated when they're trying to raise their teenage boys to be good people, yet all their teenage boys want to do is sin, like normal teenage boys. They get frustrated because they don't understand what's going on, and they'll grasp at anything they can. People long for the ultimate, God-breathed truths of Scripture, even if they don't know it. Even if they don't quite understand that the truths in Scripture are exactly, are exactly the truths and morality provided by God that we are to live by. People long for it, which again, I have to put a plug in here. Of course, this is a perfect opportunity for you to continuously be reaching out to your friends, family, and coworkers with the word of God. You do not have to have the magical superpower of evangelism to show someone Christ. You need the Bible. Share some scripture with them. Sit down and be like, hey, can I read like a chapter with you a week? This is a great opportunity because God's word is going to be much more effective than you will ever be. No offense, <laughs> but it's true. God's word is going to mean and do so much more than you ever could. What's astonishing is that even as Christians, how often we hold on to so tightly, so tightly to things that are not God's word. Things that just make us feel good, things that make us feel self-assured that what we're doing is the right thing. Let me encourage you, church, grasp tightly the God-breathed, trustworthy truth more than anything else. Grasping onto anything else as truth is like taking a leap of faith with nothing and no one to catch you. Let me say that again. Grasping onto anything else besides the truth of God's word is like taking a leap of faith with nothing to catch you and no one to catch you. Let me share with you a story about George Gibson Pauley. He was a boy in Richmond. He had hit a baseball onto the roof of a six-story building. Like most with the Sandlot games, it was the only ball the boys had, so George promptly climbed up the outside of the building and retrieved it. 
This was the start of a career of his for scaling buildings, and eventually he earned the title, the human fly. Maybe you've heard of him throughout history. Over his career, he scaled the outside of more than 2,000 buildings. And then in 1920, he climbed up the side of the Woolworth Building in New York and made it to the 30th floor, excuse me, the 30th floor before he got arrested for not having the proper permits. I don't know what permits there are for climbing outside of buildings, but apparently he did not have them. Um, which, by the way, I want to immediately say I would have been discounted from this right away. I used to have no problem with heights whatsoever. Like, I used to climb up trees, side of mountains with my friends, used to use belts to pull each other up, until one day last year, one day last year, I realized my fear of heights now. Um, in the gym, we had some lights out upstairs, and so um, uh, what, 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 we were, what we were going to do, it turned out being uh, Ken James doing, but what we were going to do was Ken James and I were going to go up in the lift in the gymnasium, and uh, so we started going up, and we started getting higher, and <laughs> higher, and higher, and we we're like towards the top of the side of the gym, and I looked down, and I realized I'm not okay with heights anymore. And uh, Ken James being, Ken James looked at me, and he saw the, like, the slight terror on my face, and so he grabbed the rails, and he's like, you okay, Pastor Will? And he went like this, and like shook it back and forth, <laughs> and scared me half to death. I am, I'm done with heights from now on, just so you know. Uh, Ken, if you're watching this, I love you, man, but that wasn't cool. <laughs> So George, when he was climbing these buildings, he let, this led him to extreme financial success. Apparently, people wanted to watch the human fly a lot. And so this led other people to become human flies as well. So they would climb up buildings for money. One such daredevil uh, decided to climb one of the largest department store buildings in downtown L.A. So a great crowd came to watch the man. He slowly and carefully climbed up the side of this building. When he reached a point near the very top, the crowd watched him feel above his head to the right and left for something that he could use to pull himself up even higher, but he was stuck, couldn't get anywhere. So he looked over to the side, and he saw what he thought was a little brick or something sticking out the side of the wall that he could grab, and then he could continue his ascent to the top. So since it was just inches beyond his reach, he decided to risk everything on a cat-like spring wrapping his fingers around the object. While the crowd below watched in horror, the human fly fell to the sidewalk and was killed. When medical attendants were finally able to get to him, they pried his fingers back, and they were able to see what it is he had clutched. They found a spider's web. He risked everything on what proved to be nothing. So many people today base their lives on an illusion of what they can trust on an illusion of what they can trust. They trust in a worldview created either by culture or by public opinion rather than the truths of the word of God. They build their lives on the sand rather than the solid rock of God's word. The Bible is God-breathed, God sent forth directly to you. This is something that provides the perfect, not just a good, the perfect foundation for us to build our lives. Don't risk everything you have on something that proves to be nothing in the end. Risk everything you have on something that you know is going to be good and sent by God for you. The Bible is God-breathed, and therefore it is trustworthy. But it's not just trustworthy. Its teachings are trustworthy as well. Through the Bible, God shows us how to live. He provides kind of like a roadmap to, to peace, to joy, and ultimately, he provides the pathway to eternal life because of Jesus Christ. So the Bible is useful. Paul says here that the Bible is useful in a couple of key specific ways. But as I was thinking through this, I, I, like to, I like to liken this to a GPS. So first, he says the Bible is useful for teaching. Uh, through it, we learn truth. So like a GPS, it shows us our destination and what it will take to get there. We hear, we hear the teaching. Second, he says the Bible is useful for rebuking. That means it, it directs us and tells us where we have gone wrong, where we've deviated from the correct path. Like a GPS, it tells us when we've made a wrong turn, when we're going the wrong way. 
Third, the Bible is useful for correction. So a good GPS not only tells you when you've made a wrong turn, but it also tells you how to get back on track in the right way. Likewise, the Bible tells us how to get back on the path when we have utterly and ultimately blown it on sin and distractions in our own lives. Fourth, the Bible is useful for training in righteousness. It tells us how to avoid things that would hurt us or slow our progress down in our walk with Jesus Christ. So it tells us how to avoid things that would hurt us. Like a good GPS, it tells us where there are problems on the road ahead, where there's construction. It'll help you find the fastest way to your destination. The Bible provides this training and righteousness to build us up, to help us avoid these, these pitfalls that the Bible talks about. Now, it's, it's not super common to talk about uh, those, those pitfalls. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I would like for us to be reminded that um, in so many people's run, running from uh, legalism, they ignore the fact that God still has requirements on you. He has expectations on his children, expectations to follow, to submit to. Now, please understand, I'm not advocating for legalism, but please, in your, in your desire to not be legalistic, please do not run from the fact that God still has requirements for you. They involve your walk with Jesus Christ personally. They involve your marriage, your children, your parents. They involve your church, your community, your friends, your work. They involve a lot of different areas. So the Bible provides this training for righteousness. Don't run from that. Don't run from that training. It takes work. It takes time, but it is a good thing. Again, as a reminder, this provides a solid foundation for us from the God-breathed word that he gives to us. The Bible is trustworthy, and its teachings are trustworthy because they come directly from God. The Bible is not just trustworthy. It also has the power to transform. It also has the power to transform so everything it says in verse 16, all scripture is breathed out by God and it's, it's profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, instruction, righteousness. And then all that leads up to this, so that in verse 17. 17 says this, so that the man of God might be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In other words, God breathed out his scripture. He gave you this uh, instruction and this training and all this stuff so that you will not be left empty. So that you're not going to be left wanting something more to be clinging on to. So that you're not going to be left hanging, wondering, what do I do right now? So when you feel stuck in your sin or when you feel like you're not actually progressing in your faith, you have something to go to. He's like, all this stuff is given so that you may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. By the word of God, the man is equipped for every good work. So the Bible equips us to do what we need to do in our spiritual lives. Now that phrase, the, the, the phrase man of God, is used frequently throughout the Bible to describe someone who is God's spokesman. So it's used quite often in the Old Testament. It's used in the title of Moses, Samuel, David, Elijah, Elisha even. Um, it's used many times in the Old Testament, but only a few times in the New Testament. So in this context, it's speaking to, uh, of Timothy, being God's man in Ephesus, he was the, the overseer, the, the pastor, the elder over that church there. He was the man who preached and taught God's word. But the broader application for all of us today would be that anyone who wants to be a man or woman of God has all they need to do so in the Bible. All you need is right here. It's found in verse 17, which again is critical for our understanding and why we prioritize the Bible. So Paul here is telling us the purpose of God's word to Timothy, the church, and the Christian's life, that you may be thoroughly equipped for every good work, lacking nothing in your tool belt. When you get busy, you have everything you need. When you get tired, you have everything you need. When you are having a great day, you have everything you need. When things are not going great at home, you have everything you need, thoroughly equipped to handle that too. When things at work look troublesome, you might lose your job, 
You might lose your, that promotion you've been looking for. You might lose income a little bit because you get sick. You still have everything you need in Christ. That does not mean that you're not going to face hardships. It just means that when you face those hardships, you are, by the word of God, God breathed the word of God, thoroughly equipped for even that. The purpose of God's word is to guide us towards transformation and empowerment. It is God's instruction manual for us so that we can become the God-designed men and women that we are to be. So the purpose of reading God's word is personal change. Uh, For the glory of God, personal change. So every time we pick up the book, God's book, he is teaching, reproving, correcting, and training me to become the man that he wants me to be. And every time you pick up the book, he's training you to become the person that he has designed you to be. He's not doing it just because he enjoys telling us what to do. Hope you know that. He's not, God's not just sitting up in heaven, you know, biding his time, loving, bossing you around. No, he's doing this so that you may be equipped for everything that he sends into your life. He's doing this so he, can, so he can shape and mold you and carve you and chisel you into the new man, into his child. So he's chiseling away the old man so that he can expose this new man and the spirit of God that lives in each and every one of us. So don't, don't miss this. Every time you pick up your Bible to read it, to spend time alone with God, remember this. The purpose of reading God's word is personal change. Not just to pass the time or because you have to, because your parents told you to, or not just because you need to get it off your checklist for today so you can feel better about yourself. Charles Spurgeon says it this way, a Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. (laughs) I like that. I like Charles Spurgeon's, that works. So as you and I read God's word, we, we, we should be reading the text with a great anticipation and an undying focus on the fact that I need to change. Not God, not his word, but me. The only person that is in need of constant change is, is mankind. You know that, right? You will be different tomorrow than you are today, even if it's in the slightest way. You will be different next week than you are today. A year from now, you will be different than you are today. God never has changed and never will change. He is not the one that needs to change. You are. So as we pick up the word of God, read it with great anticipation. Pray with great anticipation before you read, asking God to guide you and to lead you through this text and to reveal areas of your heart that you're withholding from God, that he wants to peel away what needs to be peeled away and to continuously sanctify you in Jesus Christ. God is unchanging And his word is unchanging, and I'm thankful for that. So has has the word of God been changing you? That's my question to you. Has the word of God been changing you? Is it something that you absolutely need to get through your day and your week? Or is it just an option for you if you have free time? If you were put, this is not original with me, but if you were put on trial for your faith and in his his word, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Or could they not find anything? Our cultural climate, boy, our cultural climate is filled with snares, traps, distractions at every single turn. Uh, You can easily sit down and become distracted from the Bible if you just give your mind over to it, whether it's from the political realm, whether it's from the news realm, whether it's from social media, take your pick. You know, I've been amazed at um, some of the recent hills that people are choosing to die on. Uh, Even people in our own church. Some are willing to sacrifice relationships. Some are willing to sacrifice personal goals or or, uh, uh, church goals. Some are even willing to sacrifice living out their own faith to, to accomplish uh, some hill, to beat someone to this hill or to uh, prove that they're right in a certain way. 
I know that many of us, um, when, when, when we're talking about hills to die on, maybe you thought about someone specifically that you know, like, oh boy, that person, <laughs> they have that hill to die on over there, and they will die on that hill. Um, but I wonder, in particular, who, who, uh, who chose to look at themselves first before, before starting to think about someone else and their, own, their, their hill to die on? I wonder how many of us chose to think about how we are maybe accusing others or getting frustrated with other people or getting mad at other people for, for their political opinion or their view on whatever in this world or the fact that they're doing this and I'm doing this and then can you believe what they did this last week? I can't believe this. I have to call them. And I have to call somebody else and tell them about it. So many are willing to fight over trivial things but won't fight for the truth of God in their own lives. Church, First Baptist, let me encourage you, whether you are here facing me face-to-face or you are online, watching online now or in the future, please consider this. Fight for what's important and what will never pass away, something that will never disappear, will never die. Fight for that. That's going to be there in a year from now. That's going to be there in 50 years from now, even more. I see people shielding up themselves to go into, to go into battle in the comments section of Facebook or Instagram, but yet they won't take the time to put on the armor of God before they go into work for the day. I see people taking 10 to 20 minutes of their day to sit down and read a specific article that bolsters their opinion, but they won't take 10 to 20 minutes in the, in the morning or in the evening or in the afternoon on their lunch break to read the Bible, get alone with God. Let me ask you this. Have you replaced the true and transformative power of the Bible with the lustful desire to be right and affirmed in everything you believe? I have to be honest with you. There's been several moments in my life where that has happened. Where I've replaced the true and transformational excuse me, power of the Bible with the lustful, sinful desire to be right or to want to be right. Have you replaced the true and transformative power of the Bible with the lustful desire to gossip and slander others with your words? Have you replaced the true and transformative power of the Bible with the sinful desire of complacency in your walk with Jesus? Is Jesus boring? Is is God's word boring to you? I've been through moments like that. Is it boring to you? Again, I bring us back to the question I want to ask earlier. Is the word of God something that you need, or is it just an option for you when you're free? Answer that question honestly, and I think you'll have a good idea of where God's word stands in your priorities for your life. One of the... um, One of the reasons that I chose to preach this message was because this is something that has been constantly on my mind since the beginning of coronavirus, especially because when so many people were stuck at home because they couldn't work or they couldn't do anything, you know, you find yourself becoming easily distracted. It's amazing how when you have, uh, when you're at home or when there's not as many people to be with, it's amazing how easily you can disappear into the internet or you can become so distracted with a million different things. And then... God began to impress on me more and more and more the need for his word more and more and more in my life. And this was something that is humbling and it's hard, but it's also something that we need to be constantly reminded of no matter your maturity in your Christian walk. You will never not need the word of God. You will always need it. So if I could, please allow me to close with this. God, through the power of his word, still changes hearts. I'm so thankful for that because I'm stubborn, (laughs) you know? Um, I'm so thankful that he continuously chooses to sanctify messed up people like you and me. I've spoken with you, uh, quite a few of you who have felt um, stuck, kind of stuck in the mud in your walk walk with God, feel like you aren't making progress in your faith. My first question every single time we have this discussion is this. How much time are you spending in God's word? How much time? And are, are, you, are you actually connecting with it? Are you reading it? Or is it just going in and out right away? It's my first question every time. 
So let me ask this to you. Um, how much time are you spending in God's word? And uh, one thing that's important to remember is that it's not, about, it's not always about the quantity of time. Sometimes it's about the quality of time that you spend in the word. Maybe you only have time to read one chapter of the Bible. Fine. Read that one chapter. Cement it in your heart. Take it with you all day. Chew on it. Meditate on it all day long. Let it seep into your heart. Let it sink into your mind. I urge you with this to saturate your mind whenever you can with the word of God. Don't leave any room for anything else. Nothing. Saturate your mind so deeply with the word of God that whatever enters into your mind has to fight its way through the truth of God's word before it takes root. Fill your mind up so much that there's not room for anything else. God's word is, is non-negotiable. It's trustworthy in its teachings because it's directly breathed out by God. And it's also unmatched in its transformative power to change messed up people like you and I. So my prayer for myself and my prayer for us as First Baptist Church is that we would not just know that God's word is trustworthy and transformative, but that we would believe it so deeply that we would choose every day to saturate our entire lives with the word of God. That's my prayer for myself. That's my prayer for us as a church family. So if you would, please bow your heads and pray with me this morning. Lord, I ask that my life would count as nothing for the sake of Christ. Lord, I pray that, um, I, I ask, Lord, that you would remind me daily of my need of submitting to you, my need of saturating and submerging my life into your word and submerging my thoughts into your word. Lord, I know I need that. I pray that for my church here, Lord, First Baptist. Lord, I know that, um, I know that you long for your people to draw close to you, to draw near to you. Lord, I ask that as we go throughout our week, Lord, as we finish up our morning worship this morning, Lord, I ask that, um, I ask that you would impress upon our hearts to um, refocus if necessary or encourage where necessary to continue in the word and to reprioritize your word and to dwell and meditate on it and to chew on it all day long. And to find out different ways, Lord, by your spirit of how it can apply to our lives and how it can apply to how we treat others and how we relate to others. Lord, I pray that, um, well, I want to thank you, Lord, as we close. I want to thank you that we have your word to guide us. I would be completely lost without it. Lord, I, I thank you for that, and I pray that um, you would continue to mold myself and the people of First Baptist Church and chisel us to become more like your son, Jesus Christ, so that when people see us, they see Jesus. So it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. If you would, please join me, for sta join me in standing. Together we're going to sing our final song, There is a Redeemer.
Thank you, Will. Excellent message and uh, just a good reminder to us to continue to be plugging ourselves in, in the Word of God. Um, we are going to have our announcement video here in a moment and uh, then we'll be dismissed. And then we'll come back in here. It's about 20 till. We'll come back in here at about uh, 10 till or 5 till and uh, be, have our question and answer time with Pastor Will. Uh, you are, whether you're a member or not, you're welcome to stay. Um, only members can ask questions, but we'll get into that more when we come back in. So we'll close in a word of prayer, and then we'll have our announcement uh, video, and then in about 10 uh, minutes or so, we'll be back in here. God, we are thankful for this time that we can have in your word. We're thankful for the reminder of how you have given us your word for our growth. Uh, for our maturing, for our completing. And Lord, uh, we know that because of our sinful flesh, we have, we have a ways to go. And yet, in your patience, uh, you continue to teach. You continue to grow us. You continue to mature us. Lord, I, help, I pray that you help us to be in your word. Lord, it's so easy to get distracted by so many other things that may be even truth, but not your truth. And Lord, I just pray to help us. Uh, give us just a great afternoon, and Lord, be with our time in a bit where we uh, ask some questions of Will that will just be a time where we learn and grow even through that together. Uh, and we thank you for those that were able to be with us today. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Hey, First Baptist family. I'm glad that you all chose to join us in corporate worship today. I have three announcements for you. First of all, I had mentioned last week that Tim Fink was going to be teaching the adult Bible study for this evening. Unfortunately, he had to cancel. So, Sunday night Bible study will resume as usual this evening. The second announcement is for an upcoming church work day taking place on October 24th. We will be meeting together at the church building at 9 a.m. on October the 24th to do some work projects around the building. I'll have some more details for you next week on what you can bring to help out. The last announcement today is from Doug and Jean Miller concerning an upcoming service project that you can be a part of. Hey First Baptist, it's October and that means Christmas is fast approaching. Actually, we're talking about Operation Christmas Child. What's that you say? Operation Christmas Child is a global program of Samaritan's Purse that our church supports. Over 10 million shoebox gifts are collected each year and presented to children in more than 100 countries. This provides a platform for local believers who know the culture and language to present the gospel in their communities and it facilitates a follow-up discipleship program with a solid biblical foundation. Take a look at what happens when children receive their boxes. Three, two, two one! Okay! At the count of three, when children open the shoe boxes, they're so excited. I mean, it's just been incredible. Kids are so excited. Giving them a gift, do it in Jesus' name, and that's what this is all about. Jesus loves you. It's a gospel opportunity. It's the chance for the children to change the entire life. The word of God is spreading. The gospel is advancing. It is impacting children. It is impacting families. It is impacting the world greatly. Thank you for praying. Thank you for giving. God will bless and God will use your gift to touch the life of a child and to be able to do it in Jesus' name. So thank you. Thank you for being a part of it. God bless each and every one of you. Our part, along with thousands of other churches, is to provide the Christmas gift boxes that are handed out to bless the children in the name of Jesus and to open doors to share the gospel with them. First Baptist is now kicking off our 2020 efforts to get behind this great program. Doug and I are leading it this year and we'll be at a table in the annex after the service to talk with you and let you know how you can help. What you can begin doing right now 
is to start collecting the list of materials that will go in your church box. Or you can stop by the table in the annex and we'll give you everything you need to help. We'll also be sending information about this to everyone via email so that those of you who are worshiping with us remotely during this pandemic can help. This is such a fun and effective way for both individuals and families to share the good news around the world. I can't wait to get started. That's it for the announcements for this week. If this is your first time joining us for worship at First Baptist, either online or in person, thanks for worshiping with us. If you're here in person, please feel free to stop by our guest center in the annex, and there you'll be able to find some gift mugs that we have set out for you. First Baptist family, I hope you have an awesome week.